everybody uh, to the all party group on uh, coronavirus. Uh, this week's session uh, is focused on the test and trace uh, system. And we are delighted to have uh, many uh, illustrious uh, panelists with us today. Uh, for the first session, uh, we've got the Royal College of Physicians, Professor Andrew Goddard, and the Royal College of Pathologists, Professor Joe Martin. And then in the second session that will start at 12.30, uh, that will last an hour, uh, we've got Mark Adams, the CEO of the Community Integrated uh, Care, and we've got uh, also Professor Gabriel Scali and Professor Brian uh, Durden CBE. So we are going to start uh, without further ado and uh, I'll do some quick introductions and then get to it because there is a huge amount to discuss today. Um, but in this first session we've got Professor Andrew Goddard, the President of the Royal College of Physicians and a consultant physician and gastroenterologist at the Royal Derby Hospital and Professor Joe Martin is the uh, President of the Royal College of Pathologists. Uh, Joe is a practicing uh, histopathologist and Professor of Pathology at Queen Mary University of London. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for coming to answer our questions. And I thought I'd start with the most topical one, uh, which is that, of course, today we heard that, um, and yesterday as well, that Matt Hancock is planning to uh, roll together all these organisations, get rid of Public Health England, and create some kind of super arching body in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I just want to simply ask uh, your initial reactions to that. So Andrew and then Joe, if you wouldn't mind giving us your reaction, is this going to work? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so just for people watching, um, I, it has my label as Andrew Goddard MP. I'm, I'm not a member of Parliament uh, at the moment. I have no plans to be so. Uh, <laughs> yes, it, we can remove that. Uh, I'm just an NHS consultant. So, um, yeah, clearly uh, there have been thoughts about what might happen with PHE in the future for, for many weeks ever since the pandemic started. So I don't think uh, the announcement came as much of a surprise. Uh, I think the timing, though, is is not good. Uh, we are still in the middle of this pandemic and to think about a reorganisation of the systems right now is probably not right. I think I'd also take the opportunity to say that the, you know the staff within PHE have worked above and beyond uh, completely over the past months uh, and many have worked seven day weeks, sort of 16 hour days uh, and I, I think that sort of the, the announcement about all of this will just undermine them and we risk losing some very, very talented people uh, if we're not careful. So it needs to be managed very carefully as the transition to the new organisation happens. As an aside, uh, while it's good that we have a clear focus on protection, uh, all of this is focusing very much on coronavirus and we mustn't forget all the other viral diseases that we have and, and the other risk of other pandemics. But what COVID has shown us most strongly is that, it, that we still have huge problems with uh, health inequalities in our society uh, and focusing on prevention and public health as a whole and the prevention aspects of PHE. Uh, we need to make sure that they are loved and uh, supported both you know, sort of through funding, but also organizationally moving forward as much as the protection issues. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Joe Martin. Thank you very much. Um, I would echo absolutely everything that uh, Dr. Goddard has, has, has said. I think the, the timing is interesting. Um, our microbiologists, many of whom work with uh, PHE, our virologists, our immunologists who work with PHE, are all in the middle of uh, coping with infection control changes, dealing with patients. Um, and dealing with the fallout um, from the pandemic. Uh, many of them hold joint positions with PHE and they are very worried. So I, th I think this is, this is difficult timing, I, I would agree entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, PHE staff have been astonishing. Um, they have worked absolutely creating evidence gathering evidence and uh as as bod says any time of the day or night if i wanted to know something there would be somebody in phe who would respond to that um you know groups created information sharing and uh the willingness um to really go and above and beyond has been um has been 
admirable, absolutely admirable. I couldn't fault the personal dedication of the staff of PHE uh, during this time. Mm -hmm. um, I would agree entirely again about keeping the protection and the prevention agenda going. I think that's really important. Um, and the issue around health inequalities, absolutely agree with that. So very, very difficult timing. Um, there were some changes that PHE, I think itself had, had uh, wished for, um, but whole scale change uh, needs to be managed very, very carefully. Thank you very much um, for that bigger picture stuff. And so uh, if we now dive in a little bit on test and trace itself, perhaps I'll start with um, you, uh, Joe, if you don't mind. In your opinion, how effective has test and trace been up to I this point? I think it's getting more effective. Um, initially, I think it was it was it was hamstrung uh, by the lack of data flowing uh, between different parts of the system, uh, and I think that 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 is absolutely key. You can't track and trace locally without knowledge of the of the local area effectively, um, and I think it's moved to that. So I think there's been a lot of constructive change. There are lessons to be learned around setting up laboratories which don't have electronic links. Uh, there's no point in, I've, I've spoken to, I've spoken to the Parliamentary Scientific Committee um, about if you have a test and you, you do the test and you don't let, you, you can't see the result and you can't, don't let anybody know the result, mm. you, it's, it's, it's virtually not worth doing. So you need to make sure when you set up laboratories, when you set up testing structures, that they are integrated into whoever needs to know. And that includes public health. Um, we have very good systems uh, of electronic uh, data transfer in the health services. And that includes links between some private sector providers and health services. And I think the big learning is do, you don't set up a lighthouse lab independent of those links mm -hmm. and that's got much better having to retrofit them in in the heat of battle um, has been very trying for some of our NHS digital NHS X systems. Um, one thing that has worked well has been the linking of laboratories to uh, PHE to do automatic reporting as opposed to manual reporting. And that was all put in place extremely rapidly and very quietly. And most of you will not be aware of that enormous infrastructure change that was very, very efficiently managed. Um, that was uh, NHS Digital working with the National Pathology Exchange, uh, linking the NHS labs together and linking them to PHE. That's been an extraordinary effective piece of infrastructure that we needed beforehand but implementing it at speed during the pandemic has been very efficient Thank having you. having a separation between regional and local directors of public health has been difficult i think um, and having to put in data sharing agreements between different parts of the same health health um you know public health system has has been troublesome and is it working now, the data flows? Um, it's, it's, not, it's not working in the way that we would, we would um, it, it's not optimal. Um, it's working a lot more efficiently. Uh, I think the last data, I might be out of date, but at least 80% of, of the data is flowing back to general practice. Yeah. It doesn't always then flow back to the acute sector. So if you have somebody who has a test in, uh, in a lighthouse lab, or in a different setting, both the acute and the primary care sector need to do need to know about that if the patient deteriorates. So, um, if you if somebody's had a test, it's nice to be able to see that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, same question to you, Andrew, if I may. Um, so, how effective is it in your eyes? Please don't re necessarily repeat uh, what Joe said, but if there's anything you want to add at this point. Okay. So, so the first caveat is obviously my experience with test and trace is really. Uh, 
pretty limited uh, and the only bits of sort of the testing that I understand well are those within uh, hospital sector, mm-hmm. one, so to speak. Um, I really the data that has been produced about test and trace shows that it has got better and better as time has moved on. Uh, and the large number of people, whatever it was for the last week for 438,000 or so people being tested, um, I think shows that we have managed to upscale uh, widespread testing. Uh, from my perspective, how the app uh, is going to work is is really important um, because that is a critical part of it. And some of that links into that because my understanding is the app will be able to feed back the results to that individual and begin to allow all of the different networks to work together. To me, though, one of the things I've noticed as a, as, as a member of the public is that it's all been a bit confusing. Uh, and trying to understand, you know, where you go for your test and what test and trace is, uh, mm-hmm. and trying to understand why we are different from, say, Korea or other places, which uh, you know people use as a as a comparator. And I don't think it's a fair comparison, by the way. Um, you know, why why are we not as successful as those? And then you look at other health systems within Europe, you know, Germany, which has quite a well networked public health uh, system and communication uh, around infectious diseases it seems to have been, it has felt like it's worked better elsewhere. So I think we went from a, a pretty much standing start with COVID on this scale, and we are now getting there. Uh, it's been a long, painful process, but a lot of people have done a lot of work and uh, just like to sort of say that Professor Martin has been key to running and getting all of these things up and going and her work should be thanked publicly. Well, very happy to do that. And um, thank you, uh, Professor Joe. Um, so I will now pass to Philippa Whitford. Dr. Philippa Whitford. Uh, Thanks very much, Leila. Good morning, Joe. If I can start with yourself. Obviously, you talked about the communication difficulties between the commercial labs that were set up and the results not getting to the the people who knew. And obviously, this is something we've been raising for quite a long time in, in Parliament. The Royal College of Pathologists talks about testing for a reason. Do you think that if the government had looked at test, trace and isolate, isolate seems to not get much of a mention, they might have taken a more whole system approach and looked at increasing funding to NHS labs, even if anonymized samples at some point had to go to universities or research labs to help you increase capacity, rather than creating this whole separate system that, that just didn't have the links. Yeah, I, I, I think I think my understanding is that the thinking was that large scale industrial input <clears throat> was the most e- efficient way of scaling up testing at the beginning. And certainly um, industry is to be credited for the willingness and the involvement that they they wanted to help. Um, and they have been very helpful. I think doing that without a full appreciation of the infrastructure that you need to transmit data once one end to another. So from the sample to the patient and to everyone who needs to know in that setting has been, um, I I think that lesson is is very well learned and it is getting better undoubtedly as as Dr. Gullar said, it is hugely better than it it was and I think as people are putting new contracts in place as people are um, beginning to think about stabilizing the system for the future those key elements of connectivity have to have to be in place going forward. But do you Uh, think we had there was too much of a focus on obviously we had lots of targets around numbers of tests and You know, we can argue about how many were in the post and how many were actually done. Uh, Obviously, about 10 percent of them have been removed. But do you think there was a failure to actually look at what the tests were for and therefore to look at, you know, test, trace, isolate as a system and therefore who really needed to know those results? Yeah, I I think there was a I I think there was. um... I think there was a an appreciation of the scale of testing in other countries. I think, again, having wide scale access to testing was clearly going to be needed. 
um, as as you say, we, you know, we we our testing strategy document please clearly says you know you need to test for a purpose. It needs to be a test for a purpose. I think at the beginning of the pandemic, there was very wide scale concern that we weren't going to have enough testing available. A lot of other countries had very big, um, had the ability to scale up um, testing very rapidly. And also, I think we were bearing in mind at the time that we were in international competition for consumables. So these are new tests they're produced by industry and initially the, the supplies were very limited. And even within the health service, so, so you set up the lighthouses, they've got particular technology, which means that the NHS didn't always have um, access to that technology. So the NHS was changing the testing that they were doing really very, very often. So the burden of adoption and changing which tests we were using across the health services um, across all four nations was considerable. So it wasn't just the implications of ramping up the testing, but people were having to, to duck and weave with what testing platforms they were using the whole time. Most, most labs have had to switch um, and, and most labs have had to switch several times from one platform to another during this pandemic so far. They've done an astounding job. Looking at the, the SAGE minutes, which are of course now public, there was a lot of discussion about serological testing in the early meetings. Do you think that there was confusion, I mean, not necessarily within SAGE, but within the government interpretation, serological testing is more about studying the pandemic and its spread rather than managing it. Whereas maybe if it had been modeled, it wasn't modeled in the ICL modeling at the beginning, that maybe if the impact of test trace isolate had been included in the model, there would have been an earlier recognition that this is probably the single most central thing you have to get right and that we have to get right before next winter. So I I think there was uh, a, a great deal of hope that lateral flow tests would be available that were productive. There was a lot of hope that a lot of the serology tests would come on quicker than they did and that they would be available for widespread, wide, widespread population testing. But that wouldn't uh, help you manage a person though. No, it doesn't. Later. It doesn't help matter. And, it, and also at that stage, we had no idea how long the immunity would last and actually whether the immunity, that, the immune reaction that you produce defends you against the virus. So, you know, so you're batting, yeah, exactly. So you're batting, uh, you know, you're batting with, yes, you can prove that you've been exposed to the virus, but is that antibody um, level uh, indicative that you won't get it again, and we still we're, we're still gathering data on that. Um, but with all that focus in the early sage discussions. Do you think that was because of the discussion about herd immunity? You know, let's let people get infected, let's build up population immunity, and then we don't need to worry. Because you would have thought that the recognition would have been for the tests that help you manage, which is the PCR antigen tests. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't party to uh, to the SAGE discussion, so I can't... I mean, the um, minutes are published. I mean, obviously yeah. none of us were. I, 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 can't, I can't comment on the rationale for that particular discussion at that, that stage. I know there was... Um, I mean, there's always a concern about population level, particularly in the, in the absence of a vaccine also. OK, thank you. Yeah. I don't have any specific questions for you, Andrew, unless you want to add anything or, on that topic. Uh, no, not really. I mean, I, I think that the conversations with us, the chief medical officer was very clear that serological testing was there to understand the epidemiology. It wasn't about managing the, you know, the cases uh, um, and the challenges with the PCR testing and its uh, relatively high false negative rate um, was perhaps as much of a concern as anything. Uh, and that remains one of the limitations with the PCR test, uh, even now. Yeah. Thanks very, thank very much. Uh, Liz Elvin Roberts. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Lola. Um, a, a broad question, forgive me, to both of you. Um, but uh, 
your evaluation about the, the different approaches taken by the devolved nations and also their relationship and the effect of the UK government's policies in relation to the devolved nations. And obviously, I'm particularly interested in Wales because we have a long and porous border, but the question obviously also applies to Scotland and, and North of Ireland. Um, Joe, if you care to start. Um, so uh, at a personal level, it's it's been um, for, for our college, which is, is our college is multinational. So we have international colleagues as well. Um, it's been um, interesting to try and, and balance, uh, even within the UK, where you've got different approaches, appro different approaches with, with isolation, different approaches uh, that affect healthcare staff, uh, our members as well as the public. Um, so I think that's been, it, at a personal level, I would have liked to have seen that more joined up. Um, I think at a, at a professional level, we have remained joined up. Uh, we've remained in constant contact. Uh, we have WhatsApp groups. We have email lists, which are constantly being used to share uh, knowledge, ask questions, um, and uh, give advice to each other. And that is cross-border. Cross so irrespective of, of governmental boundaries, I think the professions have continued um, to act as, as, as one. Yeah, I just one of the issues that we've experienced in Wales was a lack of availability of tests of tests early on. Yes. Because of the um, the dynamics of centralization, whereas some have the means of greater purchasing power than others. Um, yeah. have you any comment on that, please? So, uh, so the allocations, the UK allocations were uh, centrally managed. Um, uh, that was, uh, to be honest, it was actually, I think that was a useful um, uh, command and control element, um, looking at central procurement. Uh, with um, local commissioning, it's, it would have been people were buying stuff independently and it was a lot easier to put in big contracts, secure national allocations um, and uh, allow that. And then, there, and then there was population based distribution. That took a little while to get going um, and, and uh, particularly regions, both Wales and other regions of the UK um, certainly felt that their if you like, allocation of tests um, weren't um, weren't adequate. I think we we I think we all felt nationally that across the UK that we we could have done with a lot more testing, but that was limited by the suppliers. Um, it was also limited by the technological platforms we had in each uh, location. So some some uh, organisations would have you know, a Roche or an Abbott and others would have different platforms. So it was dependent on both what what kit, what analyzers you had for, and also what supplies were available. Um, I, again, can't play tribute to the to the laboratory managers, the service people, the um, virologists, the biomedical scientists, the clinical scientists who are managing all this on a day to day basis. Um, really, really hard, really, really hard. Yep. Thanks. Andrew, Andrew. So my, my take on it is so we've you know we've had uh, the devolved nation system of our health systems for many years and we are used to working in those settings. Uh, as Joe has said, across the profession, we like to try and have joined up messages and all sing from the same hymn sheet. I think one of the dangers that the public have seen is that with slightly different messages, and I think it's fair to say that none of the core messages during the pandemic. Uh, were different between the devolved nations. That everybody, when it came to something really important, critical, people were agreed. But it, some of the subtleties around some of the social distancing, some of the lockdown procedures, masks, etc., has differed between different devolved nations. And I think that's caused confusion. And when you have a public health emergency as we've had, the more messages that are out there that are confusing uh, from different groups of people and from different politicians causes. Uh, a problem and actually makes the success of public health interventions less 
likely to be as high as you could have if you had a single joined up message. I know that all of the chief medical officers from the four devolved nations had regular meetings, met together, tried to agree and tried to all go things. But above that, politically, they were being uh, given slightly different uh, sort of uh, pressure from above to produce different guidance in the different devolved nations on certain aspects. And I think that was unfortunate. I think if we'd had a single message for the whole of the UK. I think that's now when it comes to delivering services, clearly that has to be on a localised basis. And we've seen that on a, on a microcosm, say in Leicester, uh, clearly near me in Derby, um, about what needs to happen to a local area when there is a specific, and, and you need to have a localised solution to uh, outbreaks. But when it comes to the United Kingdom, I would have preferred it if there had been a little bit more uh, consistency of messaging. But I reiterate, for the key things, there was consistency of those messaging. But for the more sort of things that I'd like to have a slight less, still important if you add them all together, effect on controlling the disease, there was a bit too much difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Manura Wilson. Thank you, Leila. Um, could you please, uh, and I, this is uh, directed largely at Dr. Goddard, um, tell us a bit more about the effectiveness of uh, testing of frontline staff over the course of the last few months, and indeed um, the sort of status and effectiveness of that today, um, and the impact it's had on frontline service delivery. Obviously, Joe, you may want to add to it, but I think it's mainly one for you, Dr. Goddard. Okay, so it clearly changed quite a lot. Um, as, as you'll be aware that, you know, we did a number of surveys every three weeks during the pandemic to try and assess what was happening. And the first survey we did was uh, on the 1st and 2nd of April. Uh, and what we found there was that only 31% of uh, physicians in the NHS, and that's across all four devolved nations, uh, could access PCR testing. Now that increased rapidly three weeks later to uh, sort of well over 70%. And now it's at a sort of near enough 100%. When it came to patients, still we didn't have 100% access in the early days. It was around 88% in our first survey. And now it's clearly sort of at 100%. Uh, and the group that were, that were really struggling to get testing on were for household contacts in the early days. Uh, and that was important because people were having to self-isolate if they had household contacts. So the knock-on effect of that in the early stages of the pandemic was at one point we had 18% of doctors, physicians working in hospitals having to self-isolate at home at the peak when they were most needed. Now, about uh, half of those were due to them having symptoms of corona. Uh, a small number were because they were shielding and the rest were because they had a household contact, often children. Um, and so actually having had better testing and quicker testing uh, for those individuals to ensure that they were tested and then we knew they didn't or didn't have coronavirus, we could have got those people back to work. Now testing is far more available. So I don't believe that is gonna be an issue uh, for the next wave when it comes, uh, which is a good thing. I think what we do need, though, is to understand, for example, how the test and trace system is going to work within hospitals for uh, NHS workers, because that's going to be quite important. Um, we know that around, well, from the surveys that we've had most recently, with 25% uh, of physicians have antibodies to COVID. So that suggests, compared to, uh, you know, that are around 7% or wherever uh, in, the, in the general population. So um, we know that far, far more healthcare workers have been exposed and have had COVID. Now that in itself, we don't know what that means, as Joe said, from the point of view of neutralising antibodies and how having a positive antibody test gives you immunity. But it shows how high risk the, the, the health sector is for people working within it, as well as in the social sector. But hopefully... That does, that will imply some immunity and that will hopefully try and reduce 
uh, nosocomial spread, so spread within hospitals. Um, but that again is going to be critical. One of the other things that we found in the early stages was the turnaround of tests was pretty slow. So not only were it hard to get access to them, but actually to, to get the results. Uh, and we were struggling to get people to get results within 48 hours. In our last survey, um, sort of 22nd issue of July, only 15% of results were coming uh, back beyond 48 hours. So that has got better. But still, when it looks at the, if, if you ask, uh, positions how quickly things are coming back it's not quite as performing as, even as well as the test and trace uh, system is so we still need to get in and there were other bizarre things like you know people within a hospital were then being told to go and drive an hour down the road to a car park in Ikea to get their test done and then because of the lack of communication nobody knew what those results were so they were then still having to self-isolate for 10 days so I you know I, I, I think that it didn't work well it was too slow for the next wave, though, I think those issues have been addressed in the main, uh, but we'll need to continue to hold that to the fire to ensure that those things don't slip back. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could just ask a quick follow up. Um, and sorry, I address you as Dr. Goddard. I realise you're Professor Goddard. Apologies. I'll, um, I'll not do anything. <laughs> um, is routine testing yet available for NHS staff? Uh, it depends where and what you mean by routine testing. So there've been lots of debates about should you have, yeah. uh, you know, all NHS staff being tested every week. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about that. My worry about that has been that if you suddenly do uh, a whole group of staff testing, you then actually take testing capacity away uh, from, and we and say, because you've still got your 30, 25, 30% false negative for that, what does that actually mean? I think if the saliva tests come to fruition and work, then that becomes much, much easier. Um, but I think nobody really knows what it means uh, and how useful it's going to be. I know that there are some hospitals which have been doing that um, and they have you know, identified a, a significant number of asymptomatic carriers, which is clearly important. But at the moment, there isn't a single policy uh, across uh, any parts of the NHS within the devolved nations about how this should should go moving forward. It's much better, I think, at the moment to use those resources to get rapid testing for all patients coming in. And the reason I say that is because it's the, it's the patients coming into hospital and then that being propagated in the hospital, which seems to be the main mode of spread. If we can make sure that our hospitals are as safe as possible, and that the public has confidence that when they go into an NHS setting, they are not going to catch COVID. Uh, we can then get all of the non-COVID bits of the service back online as soon as possible and get the public mm -hmm. using it when it's needed. And I remain far more concerned about the non-COVID impacts uh, on the health of the population and within NHS services than I do about the COVID. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Martin, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think um, I think uh, Andrew makes extremely uh, good points. Um, access to rapid testing um, has been enabled over the last probably month um, by certain new technologies, um, industry coming up with new ways of testing. And there are several technologies now which have the capacity or the potential, although not all of them are um, fully validated yet, uh, to significantly reduce the time to a, to a result. So less than 90 minutes. Um, we'll have seen some headline coverage that may have been a little bit um, enthusiastic, um, but there are some, some tried and tested short turnaround um, tests that are increasingly becoming available and that starts to open up um, new ways of working and uh, as, as Andrew says it's it's the patients who haven't been coming who you worry about the patients mm -hmm. who, haven't been, who haven't been coming to hospitals with heart attacks or with cancer symptoms that we worry about most thank you and thank you well while, while the prevalence is low yeah, thank you. Baroness Finley, who's on mute. Sorry, I wouldn't unmute. I beg your pardon. <laughs> thank you both very much indeed. I want to 
follow on a little bit from, from Andrew's comments about the staff, come back to that in a moment. But Joe, looking back, how effective do you think communication has been on guidance over who should be tested and this tension between public health and the care of the individual person? And I'm thinking particularly for those people with impaired capacity learning difficulties and so on, where actually having a test done is difficult to explain to them, difficult for them to understand, and whether the guidance going out has been clear enough to allow people on the ground to make a decision as to whether to test or not, and then what to do with that information. And linked to that, whether the, um, when results have come through and perhaps staff have been asked to um, isolate because they've been contacts, direct contacts, and maybe moving in different areas, whether the guidance has been sensitive enough to recognize that some staff are absolutely service critical, um, such as blood transfusion people and so on, where there are small numbers and they're absolutely critical, uh, and whether the guidance is sufficiently nuanced to make sure that services aren't jeopardized by risk averse public health processes. Um, and then if perhaps you could take that and then I'll come to Andrew. Thank you. So I'll, I'll deal with your second point first. So service critical um, areas. So in, in pathology, uh, we've got national shortage of histopathologists for cancer diagnosis, we know that. But in particular, the, the one that can um, bring a hospital cloak, can, can close a hospital, is a transfusion service. So uh, obstetric, any any mum going into a, a, a to have a baby, um, you need a transfusion service there. Uh, that can that can close a hospital. A, tra a trauma service is critically dependent on transfusion, and some of our hospitals uh, nationally are dependent on three people running a twenty four hour service. Three people. Um, and I've seen that in more than one department as I've gone around and visited. So being able to release and protect um, those service critical staff, there are other areas that, that have critical staffing levels too, um, but being able to test and have responsive uh, decision making based on rapid testing is really important in that, um, completely agree. Clarity of guidance, um, it's been interesting. I've seen this at first hand. Um, I, we've been doing a clinical trial looking at comparing two testing methods in uh, social care. So I've been going around to care homes, uh, swabbing staff and swabbing um, residents. And they are, they're really upset um, because they were set, told that they would test and then they couldn't get hold of the kit and then they can't get the testing kit and then some of them don't know how to test. So the clarity of guidance also needs to be linked with some implementation follow-up, particularly in vulnerable groups. I couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. So the, the learning disabled um, care homes where it didn't apply, care homes where it did apply, um, I think that was, I, I, I think that is something, again, that can be learned from. Uh, you know, it's really sad to go to a care home and they tell you that they either can't get the kits or that they've had them and they don't know how to use them and they don't know what they're supposed to be doing with them. So yeah. I think it's really important. But thank you. And Andrew, you, you spoke about the need to have uh, COVID clean, if you like, areas because of, of people who are non-COVID coming and being treated. Do you think that we've got adequate facilities for testing and monitoring those staff, in particular staff who may have been shielding, either fully shielding themselves or partially shielding because of somebody at home, and who are now faced with enormous anxiety in terms of coming back to work and not having uh, an adequate risk assessment done and the uh, confidence to go into what you could call a green area so there's a few things in that so, so, so the confidence bit is is critical um and sort of there is a significant number of people who are uh in the clinically extremely vulnerable group um 
and you know we need to try and get back to work somehow um the what we learned from sort of action spreading within hospitals uh, in the first wave has been that some of those areas which you think are the most risky such as itu uh respiratory wards with lots of people on um cpap actually because ppe in those areas was very effective and was being uh, put on and taken off very carefully infection rates were very very low the places where and the individuals where it seemed to be uh, most likely to spread within hospitals were in sort of the canteen areas or other parts of the hospital um, so the idea that we might if someone's at high risk um, and we might put them into uh, sort of a back office function because that's a safer place to be doesn't necessarily mm. hold true um, I think we probably do have the, the testing capacity if we if we'll put our minds to it in order to try and create as safer areas as possible um, but you know the, the estate is extremely squeezed. We knew already that we needed more beds, but a lot of the parts of uh, our NHS are crumbling uh, and lots of offices, for example, are shared between uh, lots of people in a very close space uh, and undoing that. And then how we allow people to move around our quite um, sort of crowded hospitals in a safe way is all very, very challenging. And that's where infection prevention and control procedures, IPC procedures, are absolutely critical. So I'm absolutely delighted and proud that within my hospital, you know, everyone is wearing a mask and you can see that and everywhere you go. Uh, and, it, and things like that are absolutely critical. But I would agree with you, we need to figure out what the right testing strategy is. Um, we also need the, but there's a professional responsibility here. I think that you know when I start to have any symptoms, that I don't try and soldier on. I might think yeah. that's important, but actually that I do self isolate, get myself tested, um, and we have to, I think, be prepared that come winter with sort of sniffles and cough season, that we are going to have fewer people around if they are going to do their best to protect their patients. Uh, and it isn't about me, and it's actually about trying to protect those people. Thank you, Andrew. I think that's good advice for everybody. Um, um, we have 15 minutes left and about five to six questions still to go. So a plea to everyone, please keep questions and answers as short as possible um, so we can get through to everybody. Um, so I'll now pass to Baroness Altman. I'm afraid you're on mute. There Apologies we are. Apologies for that. Thank you, Leila. Um, and thank you, it's been a very interesting session so far. I just had a couple of questions, if I may. Um, the first one is about the speed with which the test results come back. And what is the best example from around the globe of the speed of test results? And what is our aim for timeliness of getting results back? Because seems to me that's pretty crucial in controlling the spread and knowing who's got it and who hasn't at any one time. Um, and with test and track and trace, until you know someone's got it, you're not going to find the other people who may be passing it on. Uh, is it true that the results in theory could be back within just a few hours? And allied to that, just a quick question, relating to the policy in April, and what your view is of the policy that instructed the NHS to make sure that anybody discharged from a hospital setting into social care must have had a test first, but specifically said that the results of that test did not yet need to have received before they were discharged. And what, whether you think, you know, what, what your view is of that. Uh, you uh, okay? I can start off with that one. First of all, the ideal test is one that you 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 get in the time frame that you need, um, but you've got to have it accurate and quality controlled at the same time. So um, anything under ninety minutes is very useful for A and E for decision making. The turnaround time is from sample taking to result back to the person actioning it. So it's the whole pathway. And a lot of the turnaround trouble um, that uh, happened originally 
was because we were having to to transport samples from one area of the country to another for testing. Um, the testing technology that we have in the large scale um, analyzers uh, takes many hours. So it can take six hours uh, for a routine um, COVID uh, PCR. So the turnaround time is sort of 12 hours or so uh, in the test and trace system now for the majority of 10, you know, 12 to 24 hours in the majority of the test and trace, which considering the transport issues is quite an achievement from the original setup. Um, when you're looking at uh, discharge, I think the rules around discharge, around allowing uh, somebody out having uh, had a test but not the result, were often because of this lag time in the testing. Um, and I think obviously it would be ideal to have a result before somebody left so that you can put in appropriate um, IPC measures uh, when they leave hospital. So ideally, yes, all testing would be a lot quicker. Um, sometimes it's a balance both with cost and also equipment and volume. So you can do a very rapid test, one an hour on some of the uh, tests that have already, testing machines that have already been run out, but one an hour isn't going to solve a, a, an accident, an emergency uh, department. So we're having to be really pragmatic about what capacity, what speed and what availability we've got. Um, and it's very much a moving platform, but moving in the right direction, it's moving quicker. Um, it is moving quicker. Are there examples from around the world that you think we should be emulating? I know you mentioned we can't compare ourselves with South Korea and Germany. Um, actually, I think it was Professor Goddard who said that, I'm sorry. Uh, but which countries are doing this much quicker than we are? And what can we learn? So there are some, uh, I, th I think we've adopted not necessarily nationally, but we've adopted some of the technology already. So we've been learning very, very rapidly. So the some of the lamp technology um, that has been used elsewhere, it's not as sensitive, it's not good for, it's, it's at the moment, it's not as good for the diagnosis of the virus, but it can be used for screening. So I, currently, I'm not sure I would put my hand on heart and say that there was any particular country that I would say, wow, I wish we were like them um, at the moment. Um, I might, might have a, a country where they make a lot more diagnostics um, because it becomes more available. I think we've, we've really suffered from that, um, that, that countries, you know, uh, suppliers are prioritizing um, consumables to particular, uh, to their own countries. Mm -hmm. to, um, you, we've seen that with the States. You've, you've and is that. that is that solvable? Um, so we have been, I think the Office of Life Science have been very active in supporting uh, local industry um, to increase their testing. Um, uh, Andrew, do you want to come in on that briefly or shall we move on? So sorry, I cut out my internet died. Um, I, yeah, no, I think Joe's the expert on sort of comparing different countries. Uh, I think when it comes to discharges, uh, I think we must remember that the situation that we were faced with at that time when those decisions were made was a catastrophic one. Uh, and that we were we were staring at a situation we watched in Italy where hospitals had become overrun uh, with patients sort of spilling out of the front doors and trying to create bed capacity in that in as faster and as safer way as possible was uh, sort of almost a Herculean task. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, if we'd have had testing that could have happened in, you know, sort of six hours, that would have been fine. But at that stage, we were still not getting tests for sort of three days for some patients. Uh, and we needed the bed desperately. Thank you. Um, I need to uh, move on now to um, Alex Sobel. I'm just gonna ask one question as we're a bit short of time. We've had a number of false starts and missteps with the track and traces. So with the app, obviously the initial app was abandoned and now we're moving on to the Apple and Google 
model and in terms of the physical tracking and tracing we've had the issue between um, the use of firms such as Circo and CTEL and local authorities and local authorities now saying their own system Sandwell has Blackburn's looking at it and the Dominic Harrison who's the council director of public health at Blackburn said simply not enough um, cases and contacts are being traced fast enough um, what, where, from where we are now, what do you think should happen in terms of track and trace to get us back on track? So my, my perspective on that would be that we need to get the, where the, uh, the third version, I think it is, of the, of the track and trace app uh, working uh, and those pilot sites, uh, we understand them quickly so we can then get rolled out and then we use it, getting as many people as possible to use that and using as many modalities in order to get effective track and tracing as possible. You know, the, the fact that we've got 70%-ish um, uh, success rate uh, of contact tracing uh, and it varies week to week in different pillars, etc. cetera, um, I think isn't too bad. And when you think that engagement with the public less than you know uh three quarters of people would have a vaccine if it was available we have to accept that not everybody is going to use contact tracing and not everybody is going to be uh see it as an acceptable way uh, and give their details so i think we mustn't over expect but the more ways we have in order to offer people uh, a facility for track and tracing the better thank you I would absolutely echo that. And uh, our local directors of public health have got huge expertise in knowledge of their area. They know the places of worship, the places where people gather and their local shopping centres. So they're, um, it's local knowledge, working with the local authorities, really strong. Um, Lord Strasburger. Thank you, Leila. Um, looking ahead at the big picture, what are your predictions for the future course of the pandemic? in the UK. And from your perspective, what changes to government and NHS policy will have the most positive effect on our outcome? Gosh, well, that's the $64 million question, isn't it? I don't think anybody can predict what's going to happen. I think everybody's fairly clear there is likely to be a second wave. Um, how big that is going to be uh, and when that happens is critical to the timing because the earlier it happens before this winter the better it's highly likely that we are going to have all the normal infections that we do but whether social distancing um, makes any impact on flu for example uh, and hopefully with the expanded flu vaccination program we can reduce the number of people of flu with flu that get admitted to our hospitals gives us a bit more capacity but I think we have to prepare for a second wave um, and what we need to do in order to do that flu vaccination is part of it ensuring that we keep the beds open uh, that we have created for the first wave of COVID, ensuring we have a, a workforce that is ready and able to respond to that are uh, all critical bits of it. PPE was the big issue uh, throughout the pandemic, the first wave of the pandemic. So we must, we're in a much, much better place than we were with PPE. But again, that needs to be looked at and testing, which we've been talking about clearly is, is the other uh, part of ensuring that we're ready and able to tackle the second wave. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, agree, ag uh, agree entirely. I'm in, uh, scientists and pathologists will be looking at um, very, very rapidly rolling up multiplex text testing, which tests for flu, RSV and COVID together. And that will be a, those will be largely rapid turnaround tests, but there's a huge amount of work to do on that uh, between now, over the next four weeks. That's, it's, it's very, very intense work on that. And I know government are looking at um, how you procure those, how we ensure supply of those particular Tests. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Keeley. She's there. Yes, I'm here. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Hi. Um, just to go back to, to the system overall, and, and the, there was a broad question, but I know we're coming to the end of the questioning now. Um, as Philippa Whitford said, the single thing we have to get right by the, the winter before the flu season and the second wave um, is this test track uh, isolate uh, system. Could you say what needs to be done still to get uh, to a system the public have confidence and trust in? Because clearly uh, levels of trust have waned through various issues that there have been. Uh, so, Professor Goddard, uh, you said that the app is important, but the, the, the messaging has been very confusing for the public. What can we do now? Can we do anything to retrieve that situation? Uh, having consistent, simple, repeated messaging again and again by all players. And so I think everybody on this call uh, has a role in that. 
uh, and we all need to agree what we're going to stand behind and then stand behind it and keep saying because then the public will say okay you know we did, this is what is there and this is what we're going to go for i think there remains too many little bits of confusing information from different groups and actually we're all in this fight pandemic battle whatever people want to call it but we're all in this together and we're only going to get through it in the long run if we all stick together and agree what our policies are going to be okay um professor martin agree agree entirely um simple consistent um yeah absolutely and um making sure that we we are all joined up uh, that we're not surprising bits of the system by um, announcements that come come as as a um, as an interesting uh, morning news to all of us. So keeping it keeping it simple, keeping it consistent, and honesty. If there's stuff we don't know, say so. The public aren't stupid. Um, you know, we're, we're we're all the public. Um, you know we 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 know we're you know. If we don't know, say so. Could could more be done on the NHS app? Do you think? Because um, I, I don't know that you know. In terms of sharing data, there hasn't been the best the best trust from the public in in the NHS and, and data sharing systems in the past. Yeah, so I would agree with you. How you how you uh, get people to realise that, you know, for example, you know, geographical data isn't going to be shared, um, and when they're putting in where their home address is. Uh, you know that's not going to be shared widely uh, but again you know all the confidential information that we do keep within the NHS generally that is kept within the NHS so I, I, I think people need the, the trust needs to be rebuilt um, a lot of it is there already um, and I think when people can see the advantages of how it works and if we can control the local outbreaks through test and trace quickly then I think people will come on board. Right. Well, thank you very, very much. I'm sorry to say uh, that we are in very final last minute. And I just wanted to ask um, Professor uh, Joe Martin and Professor Andrew Goddard, have you got any very final comments? Is there anything that uh, you need to make sure that we know at this stage? Jo? Uh, no, I would thank everyone who in Parliament, in the House of Lords, everywhere, um, has, has, has spent so much time and expertise on this. Obviously, um, our pathologists and our scientists and our, our, our medics have been astonishing, uh, as have my colleagues uh, in the physicians. Uh, it's been an epic work. They are very tired, um, but they are continuing to do everything they can. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, only that uh, I think this pandemic has shown how well everybody can work together and what we can achieve when we do work together. Fantastic. Well, all that's left for me to do in this session is to thank you both uh, for your time. It's been very rich, lots to think about, uh, lots to take forward. And um, thank you so much for your expertise and also everything that you are doing. Uh, very clearly, uh, you are very much in the thick of it and, and making sure that all of this is happening uh, uh, we thank you for taking uh, your precious time to answer our questions today and you are of course very welcome to stay on uh, to the next session but I also equally appreciate you might have uh, other things to be getting on with now um, so thank you both. Uh, we're going to take a um, just very quick 30 second break while we make sure that the, the right people are, are here for the next session uh, but thank you again for your time. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay, so so is everyone here? Mark hello, Layla. hello, hello, Gabriel Scully, hello. Hello. And we've got Mark is there and Brian. Yes. Oh, hello. There you are. Right. Everyone's here. Superb. Oh, yeah. Sorry, everyone's on. It's funny. It's funny where everyone's sitting on a screen. It's very bizarre. It makes your eyes go funny. Um, right. So we're now going to move to the second uh, part of the session. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, it's, we've heard a lot so far that is giving us a lot of food for thought. And we're going to look at it from a slightly different point of view um, now. And so I'm delighted that we have with us uh, Mark Adams, uh, who is the CEO of the Community Integrated of Community Integrated Care, 
Um, it's one of uh, the UK's largest social care charities. The charity supports more than 3,000 people who have dementia, learning disabilities, mental health concerns, autism, and other complex care needs. Uh, and it works with uh, 106 local authorities and CCGs uh, across England and also works in Scotland. Uh, we also have <coughs> Professor Gabriel Scally, um, is a member of Independent Sage. Uh, Gabriel's also president of the Epidemiology and Public Health at the Royal Society of Medicine and a visiting professor of public health at the University of Bristol. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Brian uh, Dwerden. Did I pronounce that correctly? Nearly. <laughs> Dwerden uh, is an emeritus professor of medical microbiology at Cardiff University and former director of Cardiff Public Health Laboratory. Um, and he has held many roles uh, within that, um, including in 2014, 2010, the Inspector of Microbiology and Infection Control at the Department of Health. So a long and illustrious career uh, as well. So thank you all three of you uh, for your time. And I'll open um, with the question that I started with the other uh, group, which is, of course, over the last 48 hours, we've seen these moves to uh, wrap up Public Health England and combine it uh, with these other bodies. Um, there's been questions over the timing of this in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, I'd love to um, understand uh, how you feel about it. Um, Mark Adams, what do you uh, feel? And then we'll go to Gabriel Scally and then, and then Brian after that. Well, thank you very much and nice to be with you. Um, I think from my perspective, it's a very similar view to the one shared by Andrew and, uh, uh, and uh, Professor Joe Martin before that um, I think that having a consolidated and focused uh, approach that uh, embraces public health guidance, um, testing and tracing, uh, the actual functioning of the laboratories and the interconnectivity within the NHS and social care, you know, makes a lot of sense. But probably the timing was just a little bit of a surprise that we are in the middle of uh, the fight still and any organization that goes through a reorganization, you know, you start to have people sending out CVs and looking for new opportunities and having anxiety. And what that does to the critical phase that we're still in, obviously only time will tell. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel Scully. Well, I watched with interest this unfold. I suppose as a former regional director of public health and a senior civil servant in the Department of Health myself, I went through, uh, I think, seven different reorganizations of public health in which I had to reapply for my own job on each occasion. Uh, so I, I have some experience of what uh, disruption it causes and it will cause disruption. Uh, I uh, think that it is both ill-timed and ill-judged. Uh, it looks to me as if all that is happening is recreating the Health uh, uh, Protection Agency, which the government abolished in. 2013 and uh, now we're we're seeing it come back and uh, yes there are failures in our pandemic preparations and there are failures in our uh, overall resilience but I, I would draw uh, a lot of the responsibility for that back to 2010 uh, the uh, abolishment uh, the abolishing of the government offices for the regions of uh, the regional development agencies of the regional assemblies of local government leaders, uh, all of whom were involved in resilience arrange arrangements at a regional level and then working with the local resilience, resilience for it. So all that structure has been wiped away and in 2013 uh, we, we lost the health uh, promotion agency, uh, the health protection agency and it uh, along with uh, other bodies, were, such as the National Treatment Agency for Substance Abuse, were all swept up into PHE, uh, something that I was certainly not in favour of. But it is wrong to think that PHE is anything other than a creature of the Department of Health, that it's an integral mm -hmm. part of the Department of Health. Uh, in fact, it was created uh, with a direct line of sight from the Secretary of State to the front line was what was its intention, and that's what happened. It wasn't even permitted to have its own website, its own headed notepaper, or its own logo. It was abs is, uh, and always was from its creation, an absolute integral part of the Department of Health. So if it hasn't worked properly, mm -hmm. then that is up to the secretaries of state who have been in charge of it since it was created. 
Thank you for that very helpful perspective. Um, Professor Durden. Thank you. I'll start by echoing what Gabriel Scully has just said about the creation of uh, Public Health England and its lack of independence. The, the two preceding bodies, the Health Protection Agency and before that the Public Health Laboratory Service, were both arm's length bodies with a requirement to advise government, but also an operational independence there. And that, that was lost. And I, in both the public health and the microbiology laboratory testing capacities, it was far, far reduced from what it, what it had been. Obviously my concern particularly about laboratory services, we went over a decade from having a network of laboratories around the country that could respond to outbreaks. I'm not saying they had the capacity to respond immediately to what we've had this year with, uh, with coronavirus, but the, the, the network was there and could link in with others, others like the academic sector um, when needed. And that could be done because people were in place and it was linked into the NHS as well. By the time we had, the, had Public Health England, they had very few laboratories around the country. I think it was three at the start of this pandemic and did not have the networking arrangements into the NHS where there was a huge amount of expertise and, and capacity and into the associated academic units. So these were not mobilized. And that comes back to the structure that was put into place. I fear now that with the, the change coming as it is and coming so quickly, can we get that integration back that links the testing service and the contact tracing service firmly into the existing NHS structures to use the capacity and the expertise that's already there um, as part of this. Yes, it needs to be augmented when we're in a situation like we are now, but we have tremendous expertise and competence and capacity there that hasn't necessarily been used and was distanced from some of the activities that were going on. Thank you very much. Lord Patel. Thank you very much. Uh, follow on from that, it is suggested that the new institution, new institute will be analogous to Koch Institute in Germany and CDC in the United States, which are both independent and led by professionals. Do you have a view about still an institute that is linked directly to the minister is any different? Well, Professor Scali, do I start with? Well, I, I feel quite strongly about this, uh, Lord Patel. As you might imagine, uh, I firmly believe that public health organisations should be led by people who have some understanding of public health and preferably a great deal of experience and competence in public health. And I think if you look round, uh, the uh, major public health uh, institutions such as CDC or the Koch Institute or, or many other examples across Europe and the world, they are absolutely usually led by someone who knows something about the business. And for me, it's absolutely vital. This is not a role for talented amateurs. And I, I think the part of the uh, problem uh, in that has been highlighted by this pandemic has been uh, the failure to provide public health leadership uh, in key public health posts. I, for example, have advocated for a long time that the chief medical officers should be, as they used to be, uh, have public health um, training, uh, qualification and experience. And we went into this pandemic in the UK with uh, only one of our four chief medical officers coming from a public health background. And, and with Public Health England uh, being uh, led by chief executive who was a hospital administrator and with inadequate public health input. So I, I feel very strongly that this uh, new organization should be led and, and staffed by people uh, from a public health background. But I should say one more thing about uh, the abolition. Every time I've been through one of these restructuring uh, uh, exercises, we have lost 20 to 30% of the senior public health people. It's an, a, a sort of an inviolate rule of reorganizing public health organizations as far as I can see. And I'm really worried where we are going to get the senior public health leadership from. Uh, and that I think uh, will, be, uh, will be a worry. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Philippa Whitford. 
Uh, thank you very much, Leila. Um, a couple of questions, if I could start with Professor Durden and then uh, Professor Scali. Uh, largely, these are focused on SAGE and the decisions that were made early on about test, trace and isolate. Um, obviously, there's been a recent paper in The Lancet showing that test, trace and isolate, if increased at scale, could prevent a second wave. Do you think that if this had been included in the Imperial College modelling at the start, there might have been a greater government focus on getting that right? And what is your view on the fact that we ended up with this disconnected kind of commercial system and all the communication problems we heard about in the first panel? And do you think we can fix that before the winter? So if I could start with you, Professor Durden, and then Professor Scali. Thank you. For the last point, I hope that it can be fixed before the, uh, the, the winter comes on. At the very beginning, um, we, the country started a certain amount of testing and tracing because that is the time-honoured approach to managing uh, outbreaks, epidemics of infectious, infectious diseases it has been for, me, for many years. And it's crucial that it starts off with adequate testing. You have to have the, the answers, the, the hard information that can then feed uh, back to the contacts, to the tracing, to the isolation of potentially infected pe people. Obviously that was the communication bit that wasn't working because it was a separate system. Yes. Two, two things weren't working. There was inadequate testing capacity. And that was why, um, as I understand it from the, the SAGE minutes, that uh, testing and tracing at that stage was stood down in favour of focusing on testing patients in the, in the NHS. Whereas what was happening was there, there were outbreaks, there were um, importations of cases uh, throughout the country. We didn't know where they were, where they were going, because we were not testing people and therefore could not trace them. Um, and the scaling up of the testing then was done through this independent organization, which wasn't linked in effectively to the NHS. In other words, GPs didn't know about their patients being, being tested and wasn't adequately linked into the existing public health um, systems that uh, Professor Scali has been, been talking about and is more expert than I am. And it wasn't linked into them to, to build uh, a localized system. I think what, what comes through all of this is that we still need to have a networked and localized system of testing and tracing. Yes, coordinated nationally and with additional national resource for the, the scale of what needs to be done. But a lot of this has to be done at a local level. Professor Scali? Yeah, thank you for that uh, collection of questions. Uh, the, I, 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 one of the defining moments of this pandemic for me was the decision to stop testing, stop community testing and let the virus run free in our communities. And I, I rarely uh, throw things or shout at television uh, screens, but I did on that occasion because that was the daftest decision I think that was, that was made. And I was further uh, deeply upset at uh, the notion as was promulgated by uh, one of the deputy chief medical officers that testing was something really only for low and middle income countries. It wasn't for the likes of us. Uh, so we lost uh, in effect two months when we should have been getting our testing system running and operating. Um, I can understand why there was uh, concern at the beginning, but Public Health England was never set up to provide mass laboratory services for uh, the, the, the country. And Professor uh, Durden actually uh, accurately described how laboratory capacity was stripped out of what had been the public health laboratory service and transferred to the, into the NHS. So it was entirely wrong, I think, to, to blame Public Health England uh, for this. There should have been much more atten uh, attention to it. Uh, the whole find, test, trace, isolate and support system has to be locally based and that's it all we should have been even in the absence of any significant numbers of testing, we could at least have gone on symptoms and we could have at least uh, provided some sort of local service and advice to people about isolating and help and support in isolating. Uh, and we could have used the, the, 
uh, the testing capacity that we, we did have. And the answer uh, is uh, absolutely uh, a system that works and supports local arrangements. And it is local people that know their communities. It is they who can find the cases. It's they who can provide support and isolation support. And that all of the effort should be um, concentrating on trying to support people locally. And it certainly doesn't feel that way at all. I, I see very little except a, you know, a, a, a centralization, in fact, a centralization around Whitehall, around a very narrow, narrow, narrow focus, rather than the broad focus across the country. And, and also uh, take a much more regional approach as well, because it is impossible to run uh, public health services across the whole of England from Whitehall. That is a nonsense. And the focus needs to be, the, the pyramid needs to be turned on its head and the local area, local level needs to be the focus of support. And testing is very important that, but testing has to be done in an organized fashion. It can't just be scattered around like pixie dust. And do you think that change is happening or do you think it isn't happening yet before we get to winter? Well, uh, uh, directors of public health uh, tell me that they are, uh, hear these messages about how things are changing. Uh, they also tell me, by the way, that their uh, major source of information is listening to the Today programme every morning to hear what the latest news for them is. And uh, they tell me that there is uh, some a measure of change happening. But what they are very clear is that they, the, the one great help that they have had has been from the local public health uh, uh, teams, the, the infection control teams from PHE. That's what they really val value. And they should be a really important part of this local focus. And that's where resources should go. They still don't have enough resources. When you look at the amount of money that's been scattered willy-nilly into private sector companies and often for people to do nothing, and there are people locally in local authorities uh, unable to do all the things they really know need to be done for the local communities. It's heartbreaking. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Baroness Finley. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for those full uh, responses. I think my question, therefore, is, <clears throat> excuse me, principally for Mark Adams. <clears throat> I wonder how effective you feel communication and guidance has been over testing people who uh, may or may not need testing, whether the indications have been clear and the tension between the individual and public health messaging? Um, okay, thank you for the question and I'll, I'll try and be polite in my answer. Um, I think from the beginning, uh, communication uh, for those on the front line has been very difficult. Um, we know that you know, many of the government committees, you know, didn't talk about the social care setting until many weeks into the crisis. Um, we, we know that uh, social care didn't have proactive testing until late May. Um, as an organisation that uh, lost 49 people through this crisis, the vast majority of them passed um, from uh, about the 10th of April till about the 15th of May. And by the time testing started to be available uh, in a care home, albeit not with enough frequency, uh, we'd already suffered our losses. Um, I think I'd echo the comments made by my colleagues on this call that a, a lot of the problems are cutbacks in the NHS and particularly cutbacks over years for Public Health England. Um, but when we started this crisis, it was very clear that what was happening in a care home in Washington in, in late February, uh, where I think 26 people died within a week, and then the decimation of care homes in Italy and Spain, you know, it was clear by the beginning of March that this was coming in our direction. And really it, it was post-May, um, you know, June, mid-June, that we started getting any meaningful advice um, and you know, obviously stopped having things like hospital transfers of uh, individuals that perhaps haven't been tested for COVID. Okay, thank you very much. Manira Wilson. Um, thank you. I have a question from Mark um, about uh, testing, the current status of testing in uh, care homes, both for older people and working uh, and homes for working age adults, as well as independent living. Can you just 
update us all on what the availability is of regular testing for both staff and residents and how quickly you can access those tests. Um, and also if, uh, and I think the guidance was only changed last week, um, whether when somebody is being admitted from the community, they are routinely being tested on admission. So there's a few questions in there, but I just want to get a feel of what's actually happening no, on the ground now. No, I, I mean, absolutely, this is the nub, the nub of the issue. And for those uh, in social care, the only tool that we have to fight against COVID is regular testing. Um, as I mentioned, testing didn't start in terms of the care sector at all until the end of May. You had to be sick before that or showing symptoms to then go, go to a car park and go to one of the regional testing centres. Um, I think in July, we had the promise that we were going to move towards weekly testing for care homes and we were going to have monthly tests for residents. That started and then with the much publicised problems around Randox and capacity issues, it stopped again. And if I use our own charity as an example, um, a week ago, we had, we had half of our care homes that hadn't been tested for a month. Um, as, as of uh, Monday of this week, we for the first time for you know, a, a good month and a half uh, had all of the kits arrive so that we could restart the testing for all of, for all of our staff um, and how long that lasts for we don't know but in theory there should be capacity now to continue weekly testing for the staff in care homes and monthly testing for the residents in care homes but what I think is a national disgrace is that right the way throughout the whole crisis the 850,000 people in supported living environments, many of whom are you know, as frail or with many co comorbidities, uh, haven't been able to get testing unless they've been symptomatic, and that still is the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and for example, you know, there's a model of care in supported living called extra care, and many of those services you know, could be half dementia and half supported living. Uh, you've got, I think, the oldest of our residents in an extra care unit is 104 years of age. Um, and at the moment, there, there is no routine testing of staff in environments where COVID could be walking through the door. So there is an awful long way to go to get testing right. If I, if I could just follow up, and you said you've now got the test for the care homes. Can you confirm yeah. that includes both the older people's care homes? as well as those with learning disabilities? Because my understanding no. is the routine, the regular testing isn't available yet. For, no, yeah. I, I mean, the, 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 there was a, a meeting with the sector with Baroness Dido Harding uh, talking about the capacity challenges with the laboratories and how, you know, at the moment, the capacity limit is about 250,000 with about 50,000 allocated to the care sector. Um, and that, you know, can we work to do more weekend testing so that we can spread the load throughout the week? The intention at this stage is that that testing is purely for care homes. So there's 450,000 people living in care homes in the UK, there's 850,000 people in supported living. And at the moment, there is no testing protocol for the 850,000. There is an indication that by late autumn, maybe late October, November, that we will look at some form of testing protocol for uh, that community. But at the moment, we're looking into a second wave of COVID with no extra form of protection for the people that work in that environment. This um, is pretty shocking, uh, Mark. Would you say that these policies are, are purposefully discriminatory or what's happening here? I mean, this is, this is where it's very hard to second guess the, the scientists and the, the politicians who are trying to make difficult decisions. I mean, we all know that when the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, uh, as I think it was originally called, was set up, it was meant to be health efficacy, but it was also around cost effective and decisions of weighing up investment and benefit. And I, and I guess that it's fairly obvious that if you've got 60 or 70 frail elderly people or individuals living with dementia, that they are an absolute prime target for something like COVID. And therefore, I don't think anyone, anyone would argue that yes, they, they are a priority and should have been much earlier than, than, than they were. 
but I, I don't think people fully understand the supported living structure or indeed social care generally in the UK as well as they should. Um, and obviously, if you've got maybe four people um, with frailties, with, with challenges, living with maybe three or four people supporting them, um, obviously, if you're going to run testing around all of those services nationally, you're going to massively increase the logistics of the program that we currently have. So I think at the moment, you know, whether it's a deliberate decision that actually, you know, the, the relative deaths in the, in the, the uh, supported living area is a lot smaller than uh, the care homes, that it's an educated decision to get the care homes right and then move on. If you take our own experience, 20% of the people we've lost were in a supported living environment. Uh, and the first person we lost was in a supported living environment. So, you know, for us, you know, we've been crying out for regular testings in that environment as much as the care homes since the beginning of the year. Um, and obviously it's frustrating that it looks like it might be November before we get old. Thank you very much. Barbara Keeley. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, this is largely a question for Professor Gabriel Scully and Professor Durden. Um, it's about the trust issues. You've written in your evidence uh, 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 what is needed for test, track and trace to work is willingness for people to be tested, willingness to report one's contact, and willingness to self-isolate if informed. But you've also told us that, um, that, uh, that the trust is undermined by inaccurate and excessive claims being made about the functionality of tests, inadequate explanation of tests, and concerns about confidentiality and, and uh, security of data. Could you, could you enlarge on, on, on that evidence that you gave us and tell us what needs to happen now so that we get our test track and, and trace system operational and working well by the, by the autumn and winter? Professor Scully? Uh, I don't know if that was my evidence. Uh, I, I, it might have been Professor Dearden's uh, evidence. I mean, I, I do recognize elements of, of trust trust are, are extremely important. And uh, one of the first things I think that I would say about the system and uh, is that the information flows have to be both trustworthy in terms of uh, confidential to the patients involved, uh, but also they have to, it, it, the, the information flows actually have to flow and there has to be timely information provided to those that need it and accurate information. Um, I, we do need, I think, at this point in the pandemic, a really good public health, uh, public education uh, initiative to remind people about the virus and remind people what the symptoms are. I think uh, uh, the four symptoms that are identified in the UK and uh, different countries have different numbers of symptoms, but the four in the UK, uh, I have seen some evidence that people uh, don't fully understand that. Uh, those symptoms and they need to be reminded about it and what and what to do. I also think that there has to be trust built up in terms of what the consequences of coming forward for testing are. I uh, continue to hear reports of people who are reluctant, even though they've got symptoms, to come forward for testing because they're worried about their information, where it will go, but they're also worried that they may have to isolate uh, and that they'll lose income uh, for themselves and, for, and to feed their families. Uh, over a period of time, which is why the uh, and independent sage has, has repeatedly uh, insisted that what we really needed were a find, test, trace, isolate and support system all the way through and that the finding of the cases is just as important as anything else and then supporting people is just as important as anything else. And uh, the, the simple test and trace bit in the middle yeah, it won't work properly unless you have all of that. And all of that depends upon public trust and, and local engagement. Yes, thank you. Uh, my concern in the, in, in the more focused part of it was on the quality of the laboratory testing, the whole system of collecting and transporting huge numbers of, uh, of tests uh, by people who had not been used to this sort of exercise and then their handling in laboratories that had been set up quickly with staff drawn from 
a wide variety of areas because it does need competent and, and competence and expertise to to run the diagnostic service there. Um, the equipment had much of it had come from the academic sector. It was requisitioned basically into the White House laboratories, and uh, there were volunteer staff from uh, from those sectors who came in to to do the the testing, but they were not part of a system that had been developed from 30 years ago of laboratory accreditation and quality assurance, all the systems that we'd built up over the years to ensure as best we could that the information coming out, the answers to the test, the results were as reliable and as accurate as could be. No test can ever be 100% sensitive, 100% specific for what it's looking for. You have to recognize that there will always be some false positive and false negative tests. But we need to know exactly what the criteria and the standards of the tests being used are uh, so that we can assess, I say, the quality of the information coming out. And the, the public who are being tested and getting the results back need to know that there is a reliable system in place and uh, that it is as quality assured as it as it can be and then it can feed across into the contact tracing um, aspect which needs many of the same qualities there but they can then know that they're working on the the best data they, that they can have yeah can i just ask a quick follow-up question chair of, of professor scully um we just heard that um even now we don't seem to be offering testing to staff in extra care units and that, uh, you know, there seems to be a lack of understanding of the structure of care. Um, there was no representation around uh, the SAGE meetings of people who understood care. Is that something that we should be really dealing with now? Uh, well, the SAGE meetings were unrepresentative in many ways in terms of the composition of the committees. Uh, we knew that there weren't public health people involved uh, at the beginning. And uh, I, I think the whole advisory structure is really important and there does need to be engagement. But I, I, I think um, your uh, question reveals a, a fundamental problem at the present time. There, the government does not have a strategy for COVID-19 remarkably doesn't have a strategy. The last time it produced a strategy was on the 3rd of March. Uh, it has produced a strategy for loosening the social restrictions, loosening the lockdown, but no strategy, there is no written strategy for dealing with COVID-19 and the way forward to do that and what the elements of uh, that would be. And, and, and your point uh, about um, where the testing should be focused should be a strategic. There should be a strategic approach, and there isn't a strategic approach. So that's behind my sort of concern about the testing uh, uh, and the way it is happening at the moment, almost uh, erratically. For example, I give you an example where I think there's a major gap, and that is when uh, when a, a positive is found and contacts are obtained and those contacts are traced, they're told to isolate. And if they have symptoms, come forward for testing. I think that's wrong. I think all close contacts of people who test positive should be tested in their own right, because we know that there are uh, many asymptomatic people who will carry the virus, can transmit the virus. And uh, if, if they're not developing symptoms, they may think, well, and they're not being tested, they may think they're fine. And we really need to... And that's just one example of where I think we absolutely need a proper strategy for COVID-19 from the government. And from my point of view, and I've been advocating this for some time, the best way across the UK is that we adopt a, a principled approach and that principle should be to get us to zero COVID, to get down to no cases and to keep it there. That should be at the basis of our whole strategy. But there is not one at the moment. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you uh, very much. Lord Russell. Well, Professor Scaddy, thank you. That was deeply depressing, um, but probably very, very accurate. I mean, I'm very conscious that time is uh, fleeting past very quickly. We have the schools, we hope, about to open, the universities about to reconvene. Um, and as you said, we don't seem to have a clear strategy. 
I would feel a lot more comfortable if the new chair of the organization being created had been the chief executive of a company called uh, Test Test rather than Talk Talk, which does seem to be rather symptomatic of the government's approach. Um, but given where we are and given the fact that we do not appear to have a coherent government strategy, are there examples in other countries which are having many of the same problems that we're experiencing that we should be looking at closely and that we can try and see if we can adapt uh, to, to our circumstances and find a way of persuading the government uh, that it will not lose face by so doing and that actually it will help mitigate the situation we're in. Could I start with Professor Scali? Yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, there, there, I'm sorry for being a pessimist or, or coming over as a pessimist. I'm not actually. I'm, I'm, I'm a tremendous op optimist. You have to be in public health, I think. And, uh, I, but, I, but I do recognise the, the, uh, the, the saying that uh, uh, an optimist is someone who hasn't heard the bad news yet. Um, on this occasion, uh, I, I, I am optimistic and I think there are ways forward. And you touch on an extraordinarily important point. The, um, the necessity of learning from elsewhere is vital and it is something that has been neglected almost from day one. The failure to look at what other people were doing and doing successfully, particularly in that period when we had several weeks grace to look around the world and see where were the successful uh, operations and how could we, how could we uh, replicate them. Uh, and very interestingly, in, a, in one of the minutes of uh, the Behavioral Subcommittee of SAGE, there is actually uh, advice in there or a warning in there to the government that uh, press reports of effective public health measures from other countries uh, that were not being implemented uh, in the UK uh, might be disturbing to the population. Uh, well, indeed. And uh, I find it extraordinary that there isn't, a, uh, even now there should be an observatory, we should have a COVID-19 observatory at the centre of our arrangements, which is looking round the world, whether it be to New Zealand or to Taiwan or South Korea or to Iceland, or to the Faroe Islands of all places, you know, where they, where they um, repurposed their uh, laboratory facilities for testing for viruses and farmed salmon to produce one of the highest testing uh, regimes in the world. All of that knowledge seems to have escaped us. And I think it, it, it is absolutely, uh, it, it has impoverished the whole response to COVID-19. And I'm sure in the learning come out, coming out of this. Uh, your point about the international experiences is, is, is absolutely vital. Thank you very much. Lord Russell. Professor Durden, could I ask you to, for your response? I fully agree that we should have been looking much more widely at what was happening more successfully in other countries. I would look particularly perhaps in Europe at Germany. Now, I know that the new arrangement is supposedly to be modelled on the, uh, the Koch Institute in, in Germany and its system. I, that sounds good, but I'm not sure that it quite matches up with, with the system that they have. They have excellent centralised services at, at the Koch Institute, led by um, an expert scientist with huge experience and, and, and background. But then the testing capacity, which is, as we've said, is a, a starting point. You can't do any tracking and tracing until you've got knowledge of positive tests uh, on which to work. And they have to be done efficiently, accurately, quickly. They were able to mobilise a much better testing capacity across the country from a variety of laboratories that were networked and could be drawn quickly into a national system. They weren't run from the centre, but they could be told, as far as I understand, what to do, and they got going. And that I don't see in the uh, in the present recommendations, even though they're said to be based upon that uh, that that principle. And okay. and again in South Korea, they immediately were able to ramp up the testing very quickly, and I believe Taiwan was the same, 
where they could identify cases and test their contacts. Um, and because this is the only way that you can actually know where the virus is, how it's spreading, and uh, do your best to, to stop it. And this didn't happen under our system. Okay. 20 minute warning, everyone. Uh, I was, uh, Mark, is there something you'd like to add about learning from other countries for your sector? I think it, if I could just make the point that the advice that we've been getting from obviously people like Public Health England has been kind of practical guidance on process and use of PPE, et cetera, um, where, where we know that that hasn't particularly worked and served the sector well during the first wave. Um, clearly, we are also very keen to look at, you know, I think at one of the recent select committees, there was Professor Terry Lum from Hong Kong, who basically explained the reason why not a single healthcare professional in Hong Kong had lost their life and how there wasn't a single outbreak in any of their care homes. Um, so we're, we are, as an individual organisation, you know, reaching out to people like Terry Lum and really asking for guidance that we can apply in different forms of technology or methodology that we might be able to follow. And I, and I guess that, for me, is what's missing, that if there was a, a, an, organis an organisation or a body that was able to share things that could be slightly more futuristic, slightly more forward thinking. If we get a second wave of COVID, maybe we can expect slightly better results than we did the first time. Thank you very much. Um, Baroness Altman. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, uh, Professors Durden and Scully for your really interesting insights. I just had a very, a couple of quick questions. The first one I think you've already just touched on, which is whether there are examples that we can learn from around the world, especially when it came to care homes. Some countries have had similar experiences to us, but others, as you say, have done really well. And what, what would be the learning for the future? Uh, and I do emphasize that this is not about uh, apportioning blame or complaining about what's happened. This is purely meant positively to be, you know, learning the best we can as we go forward. Uh, and the second question is about the speed with which test results are coming back and the implications of the hospital policy, which seemed to say patients must be tested before discharge because there was such a an outrage at the idea that they were being sent back without testing, but the guidance specifically saying they didn't have to have the results. Um, and that really goes to the speed with which results can come back and whether there are implications as well for uh, learnings in, in terms of testing patients uh, who were discharged from hospital into care settings and also the staff, particularly those going around multiple settings, you know, the uh, agency staff, whether anybody's on top of, of that and getting some centralized system to make sure that care home staff and domiciliary care staff uh, are not introducing infections unwittingly uh, without any testing. Is that too? Whoever would like to. So I start on, on that one from a, a, a testing point, point of view. Um, to get more rapid turnaround of results comes back to uh, making the best use of local uh, facilities as well as the, 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 the large national ones that, that back it up. But uh, particularly for patients and healthcare staff, there is capacity in uh, the laboratories, in, particularly in the large centres, in, in the country, a capacity that has been underutilized. I've, I've been told by colleagues still working in those laboratories that they have had spare capacity in, in their virus testing services. And they, they were doing what they were asked to do, but they could have done more. Some of the equipment that, the, the, the most modern equipment that's in use in many of these laboratories now, and that, that includes the lighthouse laboratories, Working at full stretch can can test up to fifteen hundred, do it up to fifteen hundred tests a day on one on one instrument. Um, now, 
to keep 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 that going and doing all the quality control and maintenance and so on might not make it quite that but you have that sort of ability and if that can be used more locally then you will get the te the test results coming back more quickly in the situation you're talking about of patients or, or being discharged or staff who may need to be tested to decide whether they can carry on working um, or not. Uh, so from, from that, that perspective, uh, I, I think there are things that can be done at a local level. And it comes back to the local aspect and networking of, uh, of services, both laboratory and, and the, the public health services that, uh, that need to be in place to control things at a local level. And it certainly applies in the, the hospital setting where they have direct access to laboratory services. Yeah. Can I make a few comments? Uh, um, I mean, first of all, on the testing timelines, we're typically now seeing a two to five day timeline um, for the testing, which isn't what we need when you consider that, you know, that there could be a high percentage of asymptomatic cases. Um, you know, if you catch somebody a few days after they've been infected, and then you wait up to five days to get the result, it's effectively almost negates the benefit of doing it. Um, I think the other thing that's missing from the testing point of view is it would be very, very useful for us where we've had major outbreaks to actually have a serology test for antibodies, because obviously at the aftermath of a major outbreak break and many people passing away, it would be very interesting to know whether our kind of barrier nursing and cross infection controls have actually contained it to the people that were affected or whether actually more or less the whole home of staff and residents got it, but they were asymptomatic and survived it. And I think that would also give useful learning that could help you to plan differently. In terms of what we're seeing internationally on, on that part of your question, um, we're looking at uh, different countries and different social care settings using cohorting very differently in terms of segmenting homes, uh, creating quarantine areas, creating areas where uh, staff come in and they don and doff PPE in a safe area. Um, you know, because of static electricity, you know, wearing hair nets and making sure that, you know, you're not, you're not creating environments that could attract the virus. And then there's other care homes in other parts of the world that are using booths that every staff member walks into on the way in and on the way out, which extinguishes any virus on clothing or hair or shoes. Uh, and then uh, other um, care homes and hospitals using forms of robotics where they will have um, an ability to disinfect and use UV light where there isn't a human being in the room. And again, we're looking at all of these and we're looking for the scientific e efficacy in order that we can make capital investments ahead of a second wave. But again, again for every care organization to do this unilaterally doesn't make a lot of sense. Yep. Yeah. And um, Professor Scully. I don't think I've been. Thank you very much. Uh, Lord Strasburger. Thank you, Leila. Um, looking ahead at the big picture, I've got two questions which I'll ask together. Given what we now know and what we are doing now, what are your predictions for the future of the pandemic in the UK? And from your perspective, what changes to what we're doing now would have the most positive effect on our outcome? Start with Professor Scanny. Uh, I, I didn't bring my crystal ball with me today, but uh, uh, I, I'm generally uh, optimistic. I don't think we'll see a substantial second wave, and I would hate to be proven wrong on that. Uh, but I think the cost of, of that uh, coming true will be uh, an age-related apartheid in our, our, our society. I see, already see a lot of older people who are not going out, who are staying at home, maintaining social distancing, uh, keeping themselves to themselves, are, are really frankly terrified and, uh, of the virus. And uh, one of the reasons why uh, we haven't seen a, a huge increase in hospital admissions is the age profile of people who are testing positive at the moment is a lower age profile. Uh, so. I think it should be possible to keep it under control, but it will be a very 
rocky, bumpy road, I think. Uh, but the cost is enormous uh, for, for older people. I, I, so I, I, I think that is highly problematical. Uh, in terms of um, effectiveness and what an effective response would be, I uh, go back to uh, strengthening the local public health teams. Uh, I'm quite sure that in uh, Scotland, for example, that it's local public health efforts that have kept the numbers as low as they, they have been. And I'm very pleased that Scotland has adopted a zero COVID uh, approach and it's entirely right. Uh, it's an inconvenient 96 mile border, but uh, nonetheless, I think they're, they are absolutely the right to go for zero. Uh, and that would be my way, strengthen local, uh, local arrangements uh, and also, uh, whilst mopping up all those cases on, on uh, geographically on the floor, I, there, there's no point in doing that if you still leave a hole in the roof. So I think border controls on public health grounds of people coming into the country are extraordinarily important. And uh, the, Britain and Ireland have um, been in a tiny proportion of countries that have never really introduced any significant uh, border controls on public health grounds during this pandemic. And if we want to get the virus low and we want to keep it low and we want to, uh, uh, it, to return to as normal a situation as we can, then border controls are in my view, an essential part of the response. Thank you, Thank you. Professor Scully. As, um, that was very clear. And there's one of those old people who's nailed to his perch still. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Durden, would you like to try that one? You're, you're, um, you're mute. on mute. No, no. I'm pleased that, that Gabriel Scully likewise is cautiously optimistic. So I hope in the same direction that we will not see a massive second wave in the, the way that we've had to go through in the last few months for all sorts of, of reasons if we have systems in place. There's also the fact we don't know how many people in our, our population have already been infected. I'm sure that it is far more than any, any of us can know from figures because we were not testing, uh, we're not testing people who were asymptomatic uh, contacts and so on and in those early days. So there must have been far more people who um, had the mild or even asymptomatic infections than we could ever know about now. And that of course has a huge uh, impact on the uh, potential immunity in the population as, as we go forward. Um, big question mark of it, but I'm, I'm hopeful. And the systems we have in place, if we can get the responses at local level so that as outbreaks occur, as hotspots are identified, which comes back to effective testing and feeding back into the public health system to uh, contact trace and isolate patient people, contacts, groups of people who for particular reasons have, uh, um, have acquired the disease, then I'm hopeful that a major surge would can, can be avoided for, and we, we will but, but see on, uh, on that. But uh, it does have, as we've all said, implications within society uh, as to, again, uh, somebody entering the, the older age group and uh, um, it has huge implications for a large number of, of people and for their general activities. Uh, so um, the more we can keep the lid on, the better. Thank you, Professor. Mark, is it fair to drop this question on you? No, I'm glad that you have. Um, I, I probably am not as optimistic yet as my two learned colleagues, because um, obviously in the early part of this year, we saw the compounding effect from people coming back from skiing holidays and obviously the rapid spread across the country. Um, you know, we're still seeing at the moment a thousand people a day who are contracting uh, or being tested for COVID. Um, and I think, as it has been said, the, ma the main reason why perhaps that that's not translating to A&E and um, hospitals filling up is because I think the highest group of people that are being tested positively are in the age group of 9 to 18. 
um, I'd be a lot happier once we're through the opening of schools and universities and you know, a couple of months into that, if we're still at the same sort of level, because my worry is that if it does start to spread in those communities and then those people return home to their grandparents and their parents, are we actually going to have an inadvertent spread? And you know, we won't know that until we, we open the schools. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, we're very nearly at the end of our time, but I would like to offer uh, in the final minute for you each, is there anything more that you feel it's very important that we know or something that you want to alert us to? And perhaps start again uh, with Mark. No, I, I mean, I'd like to thank the APPG and uh, all of the politicians for keeping this firmly in the sights and, and, and holding, obviously, the, those politically responsible to account. Um, I think that for our sector, the, the three key things are the supply lines of PPE, the rigorous uh, stability of the testing uh, regime, and the emergency funding because of the huge extra costs the sector is having to bear. And I think that if we can get political support to find smoother and better ways to maintain that, then we can have a more resilient sector protecting our elderly and protecting our vulnerable. And if you can keep up the political pressure so that we actually extend this to supported living and home care, because they are at the moment the side of, of society that have been neglected really right the way through this crisis. Thank you. Professor Durden. Thank you, yes. Um, I would hope that as we look forward, we can develop the systems that we've, we've talked about and they will be put in place under whatever the new arrangements turn out to be in practice. I would add a, one thing to that. We mustn't, mustn't forget that um, the protection of pu the public from uh, infection, the, the public health service there and the microbiology services that uh, support it, aren't just for COVID, aren't just for coronavirus. We, we, we can't have a, a one system that's totally focused on that. If, if we then find that we can't address other issues that come up, and that are still going to go on, whether it's salmonella, whether it's tuberculosis, whether it's um, a whole range, HIV, a whole range of infections. The system that goes into place has to be able to deal with all of these, as well as the headline issue of the moment. Thank you, very helpful. Professor Scully. Uh, I think four points. One is the necessity of actually having a strategy. I think it would be very helpful if we had an actual strategy that everyone could work to and we could discuss and debate and, and, and see how we could improve. Secondly, in preparing that strategy, making use of the resources we have, for example, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, we have an excellent European observatory on health systems, which uh, is a perfect organization to develop learning from elsewhere and help us apply it in terms of making our systems better. Thirdly, uh, the role of the directors of public health locally and their teams along with the local public health um, uh, England uh, uh, local infection control teams. Uh, that strengthening that, in fact strengthening that in both England, Scotland and Wales where there are local directors of public health. There are no local directors of public health unfortunately in Northern Ireland. Uh, that, that is extremely important. And regional coordination, because of the, the huge gap there is between Whitehall and the 192, for example, local top tier local authorities in England, is a huge gap. It's far too big and we do need regional arrangements. And it's an awful pity that they were swept away some years ago. Uh, and uh, I, I think um, one of the things we actually need to do is to start building trust uh, of the public again, because I think trust has been damaged and building the trust comes from people speaking openly and, planning and, uh, and plainly and saying what went wrong when something goes wrong and saying how they're going to make it better. Mm -hmm. And that, that whole trust building is such an important part of public health practice. If people think you're not being honest about public health issues and, and uh, you're not saying, no one expects everyone to get everything right in this. We know too little about the virus. But when things are wrong, say they are wrong, admit they are wrong and start putting them right, not making them worse. And on that note, we've only gone one minute over, which I think is a success uh, in a two hour meeting. So thank you so much to you all. That's credit to you all for the brevity of your answers, the clarity 
uh, with which you uh, conveyed some very complex pieces of information. I, I have to say I was pleasantly surprised by the cautious optimism uh, shown today, albeit not by, by Mark, I appreciate that. And I, I'm probably more on your side, Mark, I, I, I won't lie. Um, but thank you so much, all of you, and uh, much, much appreciated uh, your time. Um, thank you very much, parliamentarians. We'll do a quick debrief in another Zoom room uh, now, if you can. And thank you uh, to everyone at home who's been following along on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, this will feed into our recommendations, which we'll be releasing as we go. The first set of recommendations people can expect on Friday. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.